Chicago Tonight, Black Voices, is made possible in part by Fifth Third Bank and by the support of these donors. At Fifth Third, we believe when diverse voices are heard and empowered, communities are made stronger, lives are made better, and the future holds greater promise for all. That's why we're proud to support Chicago Tonight Black Voices. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can drive change. Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight Black Voices. I'm Brandis Friedman and thank you for sharing part of your weekend with us. On the show tonight, as the Derek Chauvin trial is set for closing arguments in Minnesota, two recent killings once again put the spotlight on police use of deadly force. We'll talk with local activists and a retired officer about policing in black and brown communities. Calls to reopen mental health clinics that the city closed nine years ago. We hear from advocates as well as the city. You can't hear many speeches made by Chicago's first black mayor, but a new online archive makes Harold Washington's speeches available to read. We have those details. Just by creating it ourselves, we're already being liberated because again, that's what OTV is all about. And arts correspondent Angel Edo introduces us to a Chicago nonprofit committed to diversity in video. First off tonight, the trial of Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin for the killing of George Floyd is drawing to a close next week. And as America awaits an outcome, the way police operate and especially how they use deadly force in black and brown communities remains very much in the spotlight. In recent weeks, two more names have been added to the grim tally of police killings. 20-year-old Dante Wright in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, and 13-year-old Adam Toledo here in Chicago's Little Village neighborhood. In both cases, police body camera footage has been released and their communities are reacting with shock, grief, and protests. Joining us are Alonzo Wahid, lead organizer of the nonprofit advocacy organization Equity and Transformation Chicago, Aislinn Pulley, co-executive director of the Chicago Torture Justice Center, and Richard Wooten, a retired Chicago police officer and executive director of Gathering Point Community Council. And before we get started, we will show you an edited version of the Toledo video that ends just prior to that gunshot. We have to warn you, the video is still upsetting to watch and explicit language is used. We start with the moment Officer Eric Stillman got out of his police car and chased Toledo through an alley. You won't hear audio for the first 15 seconds. Okay, now turning to my guests, uh, Aislinn, I'm sure you've seen this video and it, it is difficult to watch. Um, you know, we're as we tape this on a Friday afternoon, it's the day after the release of that video. There were protests uh, the night of the release. More are planned for the coming days and of course over this weekend. What are your thoughts on how the mayor has handled this video release and how the city is prepared for those protests? I think the mayor has again handled this horrifically and again has raised the bridges which she did over the summer um, in an effort to protect the um, financial district of, of the of, of the of the city um, and instead has been implementing measures that we know have resulted in excessive um, violence against people trying to protest the AG report that came out um, just a few months ago revealed that when the mayor raised the bridges during the uprising over the summer, hundreds of people were brutalized, hundreds of people were detained, um, and the brutality was horrific, including an example of one, one young person being dragged through horse manure, held up by his neck, and then tossed over to the side of the street. And this is all a result of the chaos and the confusion because people were trapped downtown. So again, we're seeing the mayor implement these disastrous authoritarian responses to something that her police department is 100% responsible for. 
Now, and the city's Department of Transportation has said that the raising of the Lakeshore Drive Bridge, that their calendar has said that that is part of uh, its regularly scheduled maintenance plan. Um, but it, in the Dante Wright shooting, Alonzo Wahid, I wanted to come to you. You know, the video footage was released within a couple of days of that shooting. A police officer responsible for his death uh, resigning and then being charged. She was in court this past week. But the video of Adam Toledo's death took a couple of weeks to be released. How do you think the police and the city should be um, preparing and reacting in the immediate aftermath when they know this video is going to become public? Um, thank you for that question. I want to say right off back that I believe that it was a, a misfortune and a mishandlement of the way that they are moving forward with this. They already knew exactly what was on the video. Um, I believe that they should have taken the necessary precautions to contact community organizers um, that were on the ground, understood the um, pulse of the community, and had them directly involved with how to move forward. There's this misconception that they know the best way um, and how to handle our community, which keeps us divided um, with us understanding from their actions that we can't trust them. There is no transparency. And without working in collaboration with us to solve these problems, there's going to always be these issues, whereas they're showing that, one, they cannot be trusted, they should not be trusted. Um, they are the perpetrators of this harm. And without working with individuals that can bridge us together, this will just continue to happen. Richard Wooten, what do you think police departments should be doing uh, in reaction to, to videos like Dante Wright's and Adam Toledo's? Well, you know, uh, it's evident that we need to, uh, the police department rather, needs to uh, do more uh, of a um, involvement with parents and family members of individuals who are suffering from this, uh, you know, traumatic experience. Um, you know, we can no longer actually uh, be untransparent. We have to be transparent in how we actually deal with situations like this. Um, the family should not have been have to wait two to three weeks to see a video. Uh, when everyone else actually within the department and, uh, you know, and Copeland has already saw the video. Uh, I think it would be much more easier for them to actually uh, have uh, more of a uh, legitimacy when it comes to actually maintaining evidence uh, such as videos with the family to show them that what actually happened during the time and making them part of the process. Aislinn Pulley, are you seeing any evidence that police departments um, are reacting to these killings with changes in their practices? And is there anything that these police departments can do to earn trust from the community at this point? To answer your first question, no. There's nothing that's being done uh, significantly that has resulted in any change to normal operating. In fact, we can look back in history, and in uh, 1927, there was an Illinois crime report that revealed that although black people only made up 5% of the population at that time, we, we represented 10, we were killed at a rate 10 times that of white folks. And so the DOJ report that was um, uh, created after the political crisis that resulted from the video showing Jason Van Dyke murdering Laquan McDonald reported that same exact statistic. There's now a more recent study that shows that the, the, the actual rate is much higher than that, that is actually 22%, that black people are killed at a rate 22 times that of white folks in, in this city. And Latinx people are killed at a rate six times that of white folks in that city. And so no, nothing has changed. And Alonzo Wahid, you know, what do you think the police could be doing to uh, counter the anger uh, and the, what, the perceptions of police in black and brown communities? Well, I don't think that they can really do anything um, I don't believe that all police are bad, but when you have individuals that have been trained, um, grow, that's nurtured in a culture where they believe that a whole community is um, criminals and that they, have, that they have the responsibility or the wherewithal because they have a shield of protection around them to protect them after they go into a community and kill these individuals, then I believe that that system needs to be overhauled, that those individuals need to be dealt with accordingly, where they're held accountable for their actions. And we need to finally get away from this 
sense of having to protect individuals that's constantly and, committing harm and um, I wanna, to our communities. I want to get Richard Wooten in here because we're almost out of time, but uh, we know that the Derek Chauvin uh, case set for closing arguments on Monday. Linda Williams, president of the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, said it's almost like the American way of policing is, is on trial here. Richard Wooten, what, do you agree with that, Mark? What, what do you think she meant? You know, we, we've seen, uh, you know, a very similar case uh, of this such uh, with the Laquan McDonald and the uh, Van Dyke case. And, you know, we're waiting on seeing the results of this here. You know, when we ask the question uh, real quick about, you know, have there been a change or do we expect change within the departments? You know, as long as racism is not being addressed, as long as we're not hiring from within our own communities, as long as we're not making the officers look like the communities that they're serving, we're going to continue to have a problem and we have to actually begin to fight that so the change is not happening as fast as we want it to be but we have to actually continue to get more involved as a community within our departments and allow our departments to actually uh, uh, bridge the gap again with communities all right uh, a discussion that we will have to keep having it's worth having my thanks to azen pulley uh, alonzo wahid and richard wooten for joining us thank you up next, calls to reopen mental health clinics. Stay with us. Some community organizers are calling for the city to reopen mental health clinics. In 2012, Mayor Rahm Emanuel's administration closed half of the city's clinics. Mayor Lori Lightfoot campaigned on reopening the centers, but has focused her tenure so far on investing in organizations that provide mental health care. This fall, the city announced 32 organizations on Chicago's south and west sides would receive $8 million to expand services. Joining us to discuss calls for the clinics to be reopened and the city's mental health initiatives are Diana Castaneda, Director of Youth and Crisis Services at Community Counseling Centers of Chicago, which is among the organizations receiving funding from the city. Arturo Carrillo, a licensed clinical social worker and leader of Collaborative for Community Wellness, a group working to address access to mental health care in Chicago. Matt Richards, Deputy Commissioner of Behavioral Health at the Chicago Department of Public Health, and Amika Tendaji, Director of Black Lives Matter Chicago. She's organized around reopening the mental health clinics with Stop Chicago. Welcome all of you to Chicago tonight. So earlier today, we spoke with Woodlawn resident Horace Washington Howard about how the clinic closure impacted his mental health services. He says he used to live just blocks away from the Woodlawn Mental Health Clinic before it closed. Let's listen. Um, the closing of the Woodlawn Clinic impacted me very much so. At that time, it took almost three to six months to even get a therapist. And now I was traveling by ale and bus to Lawrence, which is 40 some hundred north. Arturo Carrillo, remind us what impact the closure has had on residents and the communities they served. Yeah, you know, it's already exacerbated a big problem in the city of Chicago. You know, we've seen through recent research that there's an overwhelming demand for mental health services and there's just not enough clinicians in low-income communities of color. Uh, we see the disparity actually is uh, a ratio that we've seen where 22% of the city's residents uh, living in the most affluent neighborhoods have an access of 4.5 therapists per 1,000 community residents. Whereas low-income communities of color low-income communities in general have an access ratio of 0.2 therapists per 1,000 community residents. And so that's an enormous disparity we're talking about. Uh, uh, Matt Richards, the mayor announced in the fall, as we mentioned earlier, just over $9 million being allocated to 32 organizations on the city's south and west sides. Uh, tell us about how that program is working to help those most in need of mental health services. Uh, thank you, Brandis. Yeah, I mean, the mayor's strategy has involved tripling the city's mental health budget in her first two years in office. So it's been a really significant investment. And we've been very focused on expanding care uh, to service providers who provide care regardless of ability to pay health insurance status or immigration status. We made that $8 million investment in 34 community areas, primarily on the south and west side. All those services are up and running. They have been since October 1st of last year. Um, We've integrated mental health professionals are about to across the city's 911 system for the first time. We're funding team-based care because not all patients, uh, especially patients with more complex needs may uh, benefit from having folks come to them rather than them needing to come into a clinic. 
We've incorporated mental health services across the city's entire homeless shelter system. So we've been incredibly busy um, because we've tripled that budget. We have, there's no doubt we have more work to do, um, but we're really committed to continuing to do it. Amika Tandaji, of course, you're among the, the folks who are calling on the city to reopen those clinics. Uh, why is this important when the city says that it is making investments in mental health uh, through other avenues? It's critical that we reopen the, the public mental health clinics because the, the private sector is not accountable. Um, at last pre-pandemic last year, we had uh, aldermen and a team call um, the sites that the city said were available. Um, many were not. Many didn't answer the phone or or, or uh, respond in any way. We need public clinics uh, so that we can hold the, someone accountable. In addition, you know, it's Chicago with gentrification and police brutality uh, that's causing. Um, and exacerbating mental health issues for its city, so it should take responsibility for healing Chicagoans. Diana Castaneda, your organization C4, um, is among those receiving uh, the funds of the city's investment. How has that impacted the work that you're able to do? Yeah, it's impacted us in a variety of ways. I'll name two very briefly. One is it really helps us in the fight for equity. We have been seeing these issues for a long time, and so with the money that the city has allotted through these grants, we're working exclusively with five neighborhoods on the west side. So right now, anybody can call us and get services right away. The second way is that it's really focused on prevention services instead of crisis services. So we have a long history of doing crisis work well, but we're tired of only dealing with crises. We want to help people heal from the beginning. We want to help them get access right away. And so part of us allocating, because of the money the city gave us, allocating our resources has gone directly straight to five west side neighborhoods where again they can call and get services right away whether that's crisis whether that's prevention whether that's trauma and healing whatever they need and arturo you've been conducting research related to access to mental health resources in the city is the need being met absolutely not this is laughable i mean we're talking eight million dollars let's put this into perspective i'll invite your viewers to divide to divide eight million dollars by 1.7 billion Wait, that's the amount of money that the city is putting towards policing. We're talking about half a penny to every dollar that goes to policing is being invested in the city acting as a philanthropist. What we need is the city to take ownership of the problem to reopen the clinics, to make those clinics the essential safety net for community residents from all parts of the city. What we found is even after this, after this um, initiative has been implemented, we found that 86% of residents in a recent citywide survey so that they do not have enough mental health services in their community, right? Adding a few hundred thousand dollars to organizations does not, it does not increase the, the access to care where we have such desperate need for services in, in different parts of the city. Matt Richards, I wanna give you the opportunity uh, to respond to that. I mean, I think our focus is really about strengthening the system that provides care regardless of ability to pay health insurance status or immigration status, right? That's over 200 health centers in the city of Chicago that are regulated by the federal government. It's community mental health centers that are accredited by the state. Five of those two, over 200, are clinics that are operated by the city. We value those clinics. We've invested millions since the mayor's taken office. We've actually fundamentally uh, transformed four of the five sites that needed a lot of additional investment. So it's not city services versus the broader system, it's both. And that's what we've done from the beginning is investing in our own clinics, but then also recognizing that folks get their care in a lot of different places. And it's important for us to invest in those locations as well. Okay, that's where we'll have to leave it for now. Uh, obviously an important issue for a lot of people. My thanks to Diana Castaneda, Arturo Carrillo, Matt Richards, and Amika Tindaji for joining us. Thank you. Back with more Chicago Tonight Black Voices right after this. few existing audio recordings of speeches made by Chicago's first black mayor, Harold Washington. But a new online archive by the Chicago Public Library hopes to fill the gap. WTTW news reporter Patty Wetley joins us now with more details about this digital collection. Patty, tell us, you know, what exactly is in this archive and why is it significant? 
Hi, Brenda. Yeah, as you mentioned, it's significant because for as important Harold Washington was to the city of Chicago and how groundbreaking his election was, there are so few recordings of his speeches. So the Chicago Public Library has digitized original scripts. There's hundreds of them online for people to access everything from welcoming comments for dignitaries like Archbishop Desmond Tutu to budget addresses to commencement speeches. It's all there for people to read for free. And remind us, you know, what made Harold Washington's speeches so memorable? Well, the archivists talk about how much warmth and humor and optimism there is in his speeches. And I think um, the important thing as well is that in the years since his death, we've heard so many people talk about Harold Washington and everything he wanted for the city of Chicago. When you read his speeches, Harold is telling the story and he's giving you insights into his thought process, his strategy. It's a great way to hear from the man himself, um, really close to what would have been his 99th birthday just a couple of days ago. So it puts the words back in at Harold's mouth, I think. Yeah, good way to take a, a, a trip back backwards into history a little yes. bit and see the first black mayor. Patty Whatley, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Brandis. And you can read Patty's full story on our website where you can find a link to that online archive. It's all at WTTW.com news. OTV or Open Television is a Chicago nonprofit focusing on promoting more diversity in television. The group works to not only create more inclusive spaces, but to hold existing institutions accountable. Arts correspondent Angel Edo recently caught up with the group before their annual artist showcase in partnership with the Museum of Contemporary Art. Here's another look. When we think about the ways in which intersectional identities have been cast out of film and television, and seeing as we're in this really, really unique position to amplify artists and celebrate the unique gifts that intersectional identities bring to the world, what's really, really beautiful is that now we have the foundation. It's a foundation about five years in the making. Open TV, or OTV, is a platform for multi-hyphenated artists encompassing different identities within race, gender, and class. Their annual showcase, OTV Tonight, explores how their artists are rooted at the intersection of art and television. Have fun, peasants! All of our artists come to us with so many different types of backgrounds, and we are providing a platform for those artists to tell those particular stories, again, uninhibited. It's very transactional in Hollywood. Um, you pitch an idea, it's like, cool, we love your idea, and even if it's the most fragile piece of art, those things are not really considered. What's considered is, is it gonna sell? Is it gonna profit? So OTV's mission is always making sure that the artists and their vision is first and foremost, and also working with artists through the entire creation, whatever level and, or stage they're at, to its completion. OTV artists Shervin and Victoria agree. The upcoming showcase will give a sneak peek of the second season of their series, Low Strung, which explores the antics of two black queer Chicagoans. You see that in white TV all the time. You see the whole spectrum. The more content that comes out from black creators, the more we'll start to see every part of that spectrum. And I think that's a really powerful thing. Yeah, showcasing the diversity, really. Like yeah. Black, as black queer people, we are diversity, but there's diversity within that. There's other subsets of people. Loud packs, loose squared language, bootlegs babble, mouth saucy and slick quick card cracking grammar. For Chicago's first poet laureate and OTV artist, Iman Loren, it's vital their work be inclusive for everyone, not just for black and brown ears. I love television, I love acting, I love singing, I live for theater, you know what I'm saying? But there's tropes that, um, that white Hollywood likes. We don't care because we know, our, we know our, our, our black is bountiful and our bounty is beautiful to the point of our autonomy is ours. You know what I'm saying? Like everybody's voice, mind, body is theirs for their own and not for 
as a representative for all of black people. And it's about language. That's, that's what it really is for me. Like I like to make language accessible for all, my language accessible for all. The accessibility OTV works to provide through critical development resources is not just for its artists, yeah. but for existing institutions like the MCA as well. That's where its annual showcase will be live streamed from. Instead of removing ourselves or, you know, immediately jumping to a reaction, we want to take the long dream, right? The long road ahead, which is, you know, rooted in liberation and equity. And it is one of the blueprints of what it looks like to hold a seat in community and, and also hold a seat within these really nuanced, troubled, historically problematic institutions. And again, bridge a gap for deeper understanding. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Angel Ito. And we've got more information on our website for how to stream their showcases from over the years, including last night's. And that's our show for this Sunday night. Join Paris Shuts and me this week at 7 on Chicago Tonight. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight Black Voices, I'm Brandis Friedman. Thanks for sharing part of your weekend with us. Stay healthy and safe and have a good night. Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, dedicated to preserving the dignity and rights of all individuals.